Hello, I'm Sartika One. Today I'd like to talk about healthcare reform, and more particularly, I'd like to address some reasons um, why, although there have been sweeping changes in healthcare recently, none of those changes are really likely to significantly impact the cost of our healthcare system. Um, despite our, our politicians' apparent ability to to address the correct issues, this gentleman you see pictured here, Dr. Drettler, I think identifies the true reasons why healthcare here in America is so expensive, and uh, and in and, and, and doing so provides us with ways in which to make our system actually more affordable. Um, the, the things he mentions in his article are universal coverage, end-of-life care, uh, malpractice reform, and a fee-for-service system. He also talks about clinical effectiveness, which will not be mentioned in this video, but the rest of the issues I just mentioned will be dealt with uh, in order. So universal coverage has become sort of, you know, a, a, a catchphrase or a buzzword. Um, but what's interesting about this article is the particular things he chooses to talk about when, when he talks about universal coverage. The first thing he mentions is that according to Emergency Medical Treatment and Active Labor Act laws, we sort of de facto have universal coverage anyway. It's just that the particular type of universal coverage we have is emergency care. So you can see there that you have the emergency uh, sign in front of a big dollar bill. The reason I chose this graphic is because this is basically the most expensive way to provide universal care. Um, in other words, what I'm saying is anyone who's very ill can go to the emergency room and be treated regardless of whether or not they have insurance and or the money to pay in the first place. But so long as we're going to um, provide universal care in this country, that's the most expensive way to do it. And uh, there are many sources all over the internet, in fact, sort of showing this. If you Google expense of emergency care, you can find such sources. Um, so it really becomes an issue of how can we still provide this universal care in a more cost-effective um, manner, and, and perhaps even in, in, in a self-funding manner. And that's, what, that's how Dr. Drettler makes his next point. So the elegant way in which he suggests paying for this universal coverage is by directing fees at unhealthy foods or uh, products, for example, foods containing alcohol, tobacco, uh, sugary drinks, uh, foods with a lot of salt or food tie in saturated fats, things like that. And then the fees associated with those foods would go directly to funding this universal coverage. So the system we have now acts on the back end and, and, and puts everything in the emergency room, which is the most expensive way to do it, whereas this system would pay for everything on the front end, and it also has a sense of justice insofar as the people who insist on making un unhealthy choices end up contributing the most to their to, to the to the system and therefore to their own resultant health care. So I found this to be not only a just but also a uh, a solution with some foresight and elegance. So there are many points relating to end of life care, um, certain types of which can be called feudal care. Uh, so I'll just start in on them. First of all, feudal care so, or end-of-life care can be defined as the amount of uh, medical money spent on people during the last six months of their life. And, and shockingly, this turns out to be about 30% of total health care cost, meaning 30% of the money that will be spent on the average American um, for health care over their entire life will be spent on them during the last six months of their life. Um, I think a better way to do it, evidently, would be to spend this 30% on preventative care during the ages that they were 0 to 40. Um, but the next thing, regardless of that, what I, what I really want to do is give you sort of a realistic picture of what end-of-life care actually is, in my experience, from, from spending time in ICUs. End-of-life care, or uh, feudal care, ends up being a person... Not un very much unlike the picture that we see here where a gentleman is sort of with his mother and she appears to be at peace. Um, instead of that, it, it, it ends up being a lot more like this picture here where someone has many invasive procedures done on them. They have maybe little to no hope of survival. There are no loved ones around them because they're, there for, they're, they're kept there for so long in the ICU that no one uh, with a job can afford to stay by their bedside the whole time. So they, they and again, excuse me, but I, I, I want to talk about these issues, they die alone like this in pain over the course of many months instead of being let go compassionately uh, over a shorter period of time with their loved ones around them, maybe in like a hospice situation. Um, so a couple things. First of all, 
It may be hard to realize this, but the best thing for your loved one might be to let them go. And uh, this is something that you and your loved one should talk about before ever having to make this decision. Um, in particular, what you can do from to, to save yourself from having to make a decision like this is make a living will. It's hard to do. Uh, it's hard to make a document that, that talks about this kind of thing. It's hard to look at. It's hard to look at it in relation to yourself or in relation to your loved one. I understand that, but um, I've seen some pretty tragic cases, cases here. The next thing I want to talk about is politicians like Sarah Palin and Michelle Bachman and, and what they call the death panel, which I call death panel mythology. So they've made sort of outrageous statements like, I don't want a bureaucrat uh, in charge of whether or not my Down syndrome baby lives or dies. These, th these are wholly inaccurate. Um, and, and the other thing that Sarah Palin and, and Michelle Bachman and people like that, people who use this mythology, um, neglect is that what we do now constitutes the same death panel type thing. It's just that the people in charge of the decision whether or not a loved one lo lives or dies tend to be medically uninformed rather than medically informed. Um, what I mean is if we had if, if we gave doctors some of the power in, in, in controlling whether or not people uh, choose to live or die, then we'd be giving that power to, to a subset of people who knows whether or not they have a realistic chance of survival who can assess um, whether or not they'll be in tremendous pain from their experience and who aren't emotionally involved and, and, and just saying, okay, let's keep them alive, sort of, not on a whim, but um, irrationally because they're scared of making the choice at that exact moment. Um, and the last thing I want to say is I understand people's reluctance in giving, giving this power over to other people, but I've seen cases where people are kept alive Family members are kept alive just so that their fellow family members can get their welfare check and spend it on drugs. And society and uh, the, the doctors who treat them are powerless to stop that. When I see really terrible cases like that, I'm persuaded that we actually need these. Um, but yeah, again, just to, just to recap what you can do. First thing you can do is pass on this video. But another thing you can do is create living will for you and your family members so that if you guys ever have to make these decisions, you've done it when you're in sound mind and not when um, the decision has to be made in a, in a very short amount of time. So although the next topic, malpractice reform, <clears throat> is one of the uh, topics that's commonly identified in terms of a way in which health re uh, care reform needs to occur, the, way, the ways in which Dr. Drittler addresses this issue are once again fairly unique. So. One of the first things he says is, malpractice reform is necessary, not necessarily because any of the things, the, the, the legal things that result or, or the cost to doctors that result, but rather because malpractice reform has pushed medicine into what, what it's called defensive, what's called defensive medicine. In other words, relying on more and more tests or over testing or repeating data, not necessarily because it helps the patient but rather because it could help protect the physician in the event of a lawsuit. Um, so like, for example, some things he mentions are repeating data, relying on a CAT scan when the clinical picture is ob obvious, etc. But the point he makes this is, with this is it drives up the cost of uh, medicine significantly. Repeating a CAT scan or an MRI, you know, that's $1,000 here or $2,000 there. That doesn't need to be spent, and this is, hap this is happening on a national scale. So that's one of the primary drivers of the increase of, of, of cost of providing medical care. The next subtopic that he mentions in relation to malpractice reform is uh, anecdotes that he's had from actually sitting as an expert witness on uh, malpractice uh, juries. So what what he what he said what what he, what he observes here is that the jury awards that he's seen in those cases um, have had basically nothing to do whether or not a, with whether or not a real medical error occurred. Rather, the award was based on whether or not the jury thought the uh, patient's outcome was, was, was tragic and their emotional response to that. And although, you know, that might be understandable on some level, it, uh, on, on like a human level, it, on a societal level, is completely unjust because 
it drives up the cost of everyone else's health care, and it's, it's completely unjust to the nurse or doctor because they've done nothing wrong in the event of no real medical error having occurred. Um, but yet, maybe they lose their entire practice or, we you know, $1.2 million for this or that or the other. Um, and clearly, you know, when you have a, a medical system that's burdened by this kind of cost, uh, it, it cannot work out well for the costliness of providing health care. So the next sort of set or family of issues that Dr. Jetler refers to in his discussion of uh, malpractice reform is specialty care becoming unavailable due to the threat of litigation in certain types of specialty care. For example, uh, let's say you're a neurosurgeon. You might continue to do um, outpatient, uh, outpatient, neur out outpatient neurosurgery where, for example, someone who has sciatica um, has had it for you know two months and, and schedules an appointment with you and finally comes in and you take care of that. But you might not continue to do sort of like emergency neurosurgery where people come in off the street after having um, a car accident. And the reason why this is true is the type of patient population that maybe needs that sort of emergency care it differs from the that, that sort of outpatient scenario with the sciatica that I mentioned enough to where neurosurgeons know that if they keep doing that uh, that that inpatient stuff or stuff from the emergency room they'll be sued out of existence they won't be able to keep their practice because they'll be sued so much um, in other words the type of patient population that, that's drawn to that will, will sue so much with capricious litigation that they wouldn't be able to continue to practice um, and he, he, he not only mentions this in in relation to neurosurgery which we see a picture of a neurosurgeon at work here but also um, in relation to uh, inpatient ENT and uh, several other specialties. Uh, in, in, in all cases it seems that the, the common theme is that um, especially people coming from emergency care you know they're, they're sort of the uh, perfect storm for, for litigation because they're often people who are uninsured anyway and therefore people who have not been um, receiving preventative care and also just a, a different demographic tends to sue more and uh, that's why sort of one by one specialty care is becoming unavailable for the, for uh, people who need it. Anyway, to get a more pleasant picture up on the screen and uh, to, to make the point that I want to make about all this is that you as just an average citizen or, or taxpayer or someone who's not going to sue every, every 15 minutes, um, this directly hurts you because if you need, for example, a neurosurgeon to operate on you after a car wreck, you are not likely to be able to find one in certain states. Um, a lot of these specialty, specialties I mentioned. So tort reform is something that you should take seriously and that you should sort of want to happen. Not only because it makes the health care that you, that you have to pay for a lot more expensive, considerably more expensive, but also because it may preclude you or prevent you from being able to get health care at all. Um, so yeah, this is something that hurts every American citizen, except for those who happen to sort of like win the basic lottery that we have, which is our litigation machinery. All right. The last topic I'd like to mention is the fee-for-service uh, system. So what fee-for-service is, is a, a part of um, the way that we reimburse physicians. And, and basically, you just give them a certain amount of money for a procedure. Uh, depending on what the procedure is, it's more or less money. And... Uh, it seems on the surface like a very fair and good way to do it because you know the more work you do the more money you get but think about what we've already said in in relation to physicians wanting to do wanting to over test and do more tests when the clinical picture is is already obvious um, in relation to this because what in in conjunction what you have is a, a situation where physicians want to be want to over test to cover themselves in the first place and a situation where they get more money for every extra test and extra procedure they do anyway so they can say oh I'm just being thorough and get more money for for being thorough and cover th themselves for litigation but what that causes for society is extremely expensive medical care um, because you know we pay the doctors more and more to do these extra procedures but they sort of have to do so anyway because of the threat of litigation so those two things in conjunction create a very problematic situation but the equally important corollary to this is this system effectively punishes physicians who are efficient and like really good at what they do and can diagnose using a minimum a minimal amount of money spent. 
Um, because, you know, if you're really on your game and you can diagnose a condition straight away without doing 18 extra tests, then that's way better for your patient who doesn't have to go undergo the side effects of those tests. And it's better for society and, and, and whatever insurance provider it is that's paying um, because it doesn't cost as much money to not have to do all those, uh, all those tests. But that physician who provides basically the better care and helps everybody out receives the least amount of money. Um, <clears throat> The final point I want to make about fee for service is a potential, a, a potentially different c um, system that we could use to reimburse people. I think a potentially better system might have the form of, of of something like this: a large chunk of money for a hospital is allocated to all doctors in that hospital doing tests and doing procedures. If at the end of a quarter or the end of a month, whatever period you want to prescribe, there's money left over in that account, then that that leftover amount is 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 added to physician salaries. So, oh, and also that list of how much each physician spent on procedures is promulgated to the whole hospital. In in that case, what you'd get is a situation where if other doctors knew that a certain doctor was spending way too much money, they simply wouldn't refer patients to that doctor because they'd know that at the end of the month or end of the quarter, that's taking away directly from the bonus that they would get for providing efficient care. Um, this system is already used in Grand Junction, Colorado. At any rate, I think the takeaway for this fee-for-service uh, idea should be that, especially in conjunction with the litigation um, and, and, and super abundance of litigation that we have in America, especially in conjunction with that, it causes really high health care costs, and therefore an alternative to fee-for-service definitely needs to be sought. Um, all right, well, thank you very much for watching. What I really hope that you'll do after watching this video is distribute it to other people that you know, especially people who might have might have an interest in politics or might have a role in politics, like local politicians you might have, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. Um, other people that, that, that you know. At any rate, I'm Sartiga One. Thank you very much for watching. Uh, the full text article of which uh, this this video is a review will be posted uh, at the URL you see below this video. So please take a look at the full uh, text article there. Distribute that URL to others and recommend this video. Uh, thank you very much for watching and goodbye.